If we take the square of a positive number, the outcome is positive. If we take the square of a negative number, the outcome will be positive as well. So is it ever possible to square a number and get a negative outcome? In the 16th century, mathematicians came up with the idea that there is indeed some number, let's call it i, whose square is minus 1. Quite understandably, some people were dismissive of this idea, saying that this number i is nothing more than imaginary. Nevertheless, this imaginary number is widely used today. For example, it occurs in the Schrödinger equation that describes quantum mechanical particles. How did this imaginary number come to have so many real applications? To understand the relevance of imaginary numbers, let us first look at exponential growth. Let's imagine a hypothetical scenario where a virus spreads through a population. On day zero, there is only one person that is infected. And every day, the number of infected people doubles. Then, after one day, two people will be infected. The next day there will be 4, then 8, then 16, then 32, then 64, 128, and 256. This exponential growth is described by the formula 2 to the power n, where n denotes the number of days. Now let's see what happens when we change the number 2. For example, instead of 2, let's make it 1. Then for n is 0 we get 1, for n is 1 we also get 1, and we will also get 1 for every other n. So we see that now the sequence remains constant. If we consider 1 half to the power n, we see that the sequence decays exponentially. Now what will happen if we raise a negative number to the power n? For n equals 0, we get 1. Multiplying this with minus 1 gives minus 1. Multiplying with minus 1 again gives 1. Then we get minus 1, 1, minus 1, etc. So we see that the sequence is not growing, constant or decaying, but rather it starts oscillating. More specifically, the sequence is periodic with period 2. Now what happens when we raise the imaginary number i to the power n? Raising it to the power 0 gives 1, raising it to the power 1 gives i. How do we plot this in the graph? We can write a number as the sum of its real part and its imaginary part. Let's plot only the real part, which in this case is 0. If we continue plotting the real parts of all the numbers in the sequence, we find that the period of the oscillation has doubled. It makes sense that the period doubles when we take the square root of minus 1, because we substituted every single multiplication with minus 1 with two multiplications with i. Because it now takes more points to go through a single oscillation, we have increased the resolution with which we plot the oscillation. Now let's take another square root. We can verify that it is given by the following expression by taking its square. When we plot the real part of the sequence of numbers, we find that once again the period has doubled, and we have increased the resolution with which we plot the oscillation. So we saw that exponentiating minus 1 gives a periodic sequence with period 2. Taking the square root doubles the period and therefore increases the resolution with which we plot the oscillation. Taking another square root increases the resolution once more. So if we keep on taking square roots, we expect to find a continuous oscillating function. So how can we easily compute square roots of numbers with both a real and imaginary part? which are called complex numbers. The brute force method to approach this problem is to take the square of the complex number, write it out, and then equate it to the complex number you're taking the square root of. Equating the real and imaginary parts yields two equations which can be solved. However, a more elegant method is to realize the following. If we write the real part and imaginary part of the complex number as the cosine and sine of half an angle, then writing out the square and applying the double angle formula reveals that we have simply doubled the angle. Therefore, if we write a complex number by using an angle theta, then to take square roots we simply have to half the angle. For an angle of 2 pi, the resulting sequence will be constant, so it has period 1. For half the angle, namely pi, 
the sequence oscillates between 1 and minus 1 with period 2. The angle pi over 2 yields the imaginary number i, which yields the sequence with period 4 when we exponentiate it. If we halve the angle more and more times, we end up with a tiny angle epsilon, and its corresponding sequence should be almost a continuous oscillation. To find the formula for this continuous oscillation, let's find an explicit formula for raising this number to the power n. We can observe that if we have two complex numbers defined by the angles alpha and beta, their product will yield a new complex number defined by the angle alpha plus beta. Therefore, raising the complex number defined by an angle epsilon to the power n yields a complex number defined by the angle n times epsilon. Let's now define n times epsilon as a single variable x and write the equation in terms of x instead of n. Basically, what we're doing here is we're evaluating the oscillation in a certain point x by moving towards it in tiny steps of epsilon. To get to x, we need to take x divided by epsilon steps. To obtain a continuous description of the oscillation, we let epsilon go to zero. In this limit, cosine epsilon becomes one and sine epsilon becomes epsilon. In the resulting expression, if we let epsilon go to zero, we find the definition of the natural exponential function e to the power i x. The definition of the natural exponential function was introduced to make discrete exponential growth continuous. And that is exactly what we've done here as well. We made the discrete oscillation due to exponentiating minus 1 continuous. The resulting formula is known as Euler's formula. So let's summarize how we can intuitively understand why exponentiating the square root of a negative number yields a periodic function. We saw that taking the exponent of minus 1 yields a periodic function. Taking square roots of minus 1 introduces the imaginary number i, and it increases the resolution with which we sample the oscillation. We observe that mathematically, we can easily take the square root of a complex number by writing it using the cosine and sine of an angle. The natural exponential function e to the power x arises when we take the limit to a continuous function. Therefore, we found that the natural exponential function of the square root of minus 1 yields a periodic function. This is a curious mathematical result. But how is it relevant in real-world applications? It is relevant whenever oscillations and waves are important, and that's a lot of cases. Light is a wave, so in optics you cannot avoid using complex exponentials. Quantum mechanics states that matter has a wave nature, so it is no wonder that Schrodinger's equation contains the imaginary number i, which you will encounter all throughout quantum mechanics. You'll also find complex exponentials in electrical engineering, because when you're using an alternating current, the currents and voltages are continuously oscillating. But now you may wonder, why can't you just use sine and cosine to describe waves and oscillations? And the answer to that is, maybe you can, but using complex exponentials makes life a lot easier. For example, consider a light wave that oscillates in time with a certain frequency omega, and that varies as a function of position x. If we write this as a cosine, the time dependence and the position dependence both occur inside the argument of the cosine. But now let's write the cosine as the real part of a complex exponential, as described by Euler's formula. Using a standard rule of multiplying exponentials, we can factorize the spatial dependence and the time dependence. In optics, we typically don't care to keep track of how each point in the field oscillates in time. We already know that every point oscillates with the same frequency, and this oscillation is way too fast to detect anyway. So we leave out the time dependence, and instead define a complex valued field that only depends on position. The complex phase phi keeps track of the delay between field oscillations at different points in space. This complex phase phi is important in various fields of optics, such as holography or lensless imaging, but that's a whole different story.